9 on your side at 9 starts now. Tonight, the face of marriage in Idaho looks different. This is real. It's official. The day many same-sex couples were waiting for. You know, it's about people sharing their life together and moving forward and really taking care of each other. And many other Idahoans were dreading. This court ruling is unconscionable, it's unconstitutional, and it's un-American. Tonight, Fox 9 goes in-depth on gay marriage in Idaho and what could come next. It is just wonderful today to finally see it here in Idaho because I honestly thought we'd be one of the last of the 50 states. After a nearly year-long court battle, Idaho's ban on gay marriage is no more. And today, 45 same-sex marriage licenses were issued in Ada County, 21 in just the very first half hour. Our in-depth coverage tonight begins with On Your Side's Chris Oswald, who was inside the courthouse as the first marriage license was issued. Hundreds of people packed the Ada County Courthouse today to show their support for the same-sex couples who showed up to get their marriage license. And while hundreds of people crammed into this building, marriages went off without a hitch. Oh gosh, it's, it's we're here. here. This happens. The emotions were clear. Exactly. Yes. There are no words. Tears, smiles, and cheers. Hundreds applauded the four same-sex couples who successfully struck down Idaho's ban on same-sex marriage as they walked into the Ada County Courthouse. <laughs> Amber Byerly and Rachel Robertson are one of those couples. <laughs> My legs are like shaking. I know. They were one of the first couples to reach the counter. We are about to get married. We're going to get hitched. I have and received the second ever same-sex marriage license issued in Ada County. We did it! <laughs> the battle over same-sex marriage rights has been brewing in court since November of last year. Attorney for the plaintiffs, Deborah Ferguson. We did this together, so. Thank you, little Bridget. I'm, I'm deeply moved. I woke up this morning and I had goosebumps and I thought it's happening today. So <laughs> With such long lines, one might expect a hiccup or two, but Ada County Recorder Chris Rich says things went smoothly and everyone who lined up for a license was granted one. Pretty intense. Uh, there was a lot of emotion with the families that were here. And on top of that, we had a significant amount of media. Uh, I'd never seen that many uh, media representatives before. Getting back to Amber and Rachel, who are getting a lot of media attention. Oh my God, wow. They say they're ready to start a family, live life together, and they're grateful for the outpouring of support they've received from their community. In Boise, Chris Oswalt, Idaho on your side. Once marriage licenses were issued today, dozens of same-sex couples tied the knot, including two of those couples who have been heavily involved in the lawsuit for nearly a year. On Your Side's Karen Lair continues our team coverage with their stories. I mean, you see this breeze, it's the winds of change, and it just feels <laughs> wonderful. It's a good day. October 15th, 2014, the day same-sex marriage supporters in the state of Idaho will never forget. We can check it off. Thank you, Ninth Circuit Court and the Supremes. Also, the anniversary for many newlywed gay and lesbian couples in the Gem State. Among those, Amber Byerly and Rachel Robertson, one of the four couples pushing to legalize same-sex marriage in Idaho. We will understand the importance of marriage more than pretty much anybody because we know what it means uh, to fight for it. The two tied the knot beside family and friends inside Boise City Hall immediately after receiving their licenses and were declared wife and wife by Acting Mayor Marianne Jordan, words they've been waiting to hear for years. <laughs> Fellow plaintiffs Sheila Robertson and Andrea Altmeyer share the date as newlyweds after sharing a life together for the last 17 years. In my lifetime, I never imagined I'd be able to stand across the aisle from the person I love and say I do. I never imagined. Tied together first by their four-year-old son and now legally by the state they love. Amazing. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. After a year of ups and downs and recent setbacks by the governor and AG's office, it's still difficult for same-sex couples to fully grasp what this day means for their futures. I don't think it's really set in yet that it's so real. I know I'm holding it in my hand. I know it says our names, but I'm not, yeah, 
I think it's still kind of really. And while the plaintiff's legal fight for gay marriage in Idaho is over, supporters say they hope to continue moving forward until they accomplish equality for all. Karen Lair, Fox 9 on your side. And even as marriage licenses go out to same-sex couples, the state says the court battle is not done. Attorney General Wazden says there was no ground to keep a stay in place, but the Ninth Circuit Court's ruling is unique and raises new legal concerns. And you have a group of citizens who have mended their constitution in an area where the courts have said this is traditionally an area reserved to the states. That is a st that's an issue worth discussing with the Supreme Court. Idaho has two options. They can appeal for a hearing in front of the full panel of judges in the Ninth Circuit Court, something Governor Otter has already done, or they can appeal for a hearing at the Supreme Court. Otter's request for a full hearing has yet to be decided. Two weeks ago, the Supreme Court denied to hear similar cases from five other circuits. Wasden says he and the governor have not decided on their next step. One of the people who wants Idaho to keep fighting, Reverend Brian Fisher, co-author of the constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. He spoke with On Your Side's Don Nelson today and blames Governor Otter for giving up. He took an oath to uphold the Idaho Constitution, the federal Constitution, and to fulfill his oath of office. And he could do that by simply refusing to issue any same-sex licenses in the state of Idaho. Now, the courts have uh, no army or police and for enforcement rely on the executive branch, but it's highly unlikely the president, who is in favor of gay rights, would allow the governor to make that move. Well, one woman who has been waiting for today hopes the right to marry for same-sex couples will actually bring closure to her battle for equality. Madeline Lee Taylor has spent the last several months fighting to be buried with her wife, Jean, at the Idaho Veterans Cemetery. Her request has been denied several times because the state had not recognized same-sex marriages. She planned on filing a new request today, but her attorney was instructed by the AG to hold off until next week. We'll let you know what happens. Well, the Bonneville County clerk issued seven licenses, the highest number in eastern Idaho. Many were surprised that only one couple got their marriage license in Bannock County, which includes Pocatello. The couple says they're surprised more couples were not with them, but are happy regardless. Numerous counties around the state reported that they did not issue any same-sex marriage licenses today. So our in-depth coverage continues with University of Idaho constitutional law professor Shakira Sanders, who's joining us tonight on set. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me again. Exactly. <laughs> Momentous day again for the state. It certainly is. And we heard about a couple of options that the state may have, Shakira. You've got the Supreme Court and you got going back to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, is there anything else and what do you think of those two options? Well, it does seem clear that the two options for the state of Idaho at this point is going what either going back to the Ninth Circuit and asking a larger panel of the judges to rehear the cases. Uh, the other option would be to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, let's talk about that first option uh, first. Kay. So here, what we had uh, two, a week ago Monday, the court uh, looking at several same-sex uh, opinions from other circuits and denying actually hearing those cases, which came as quite some surprise to several court watchers. Hmm. Now, uh, as we discussed before, the Ninth, uh, the Ninth Circuit's opinion is a little bit different. We have this finding that mm -hmm. heightened scrutiny applies, and that may be enough for the court to take up the case, but it's very unclear uh, whether that would actually change the result. Uh, if the uh, court does take that case based on the idea that heightened scrutiny, uh, that finding by the Ninth Circuit was either an error, it would really be more of constitutional theory than changing the result. It's getting to the second option, which would be asking for a larger panel of the Ninth Circuit to hear the case. I don't know if, uh, how likely it is that the, the Ninth Circuit would actually hear it. It seems like they're kind of done with that in, yeah. in some ways, especially after what happened today with marriage licenses already being issued. So my question for you, Shakira, then, is does Idaho have any chance of going, say, the way of Utah, where at first we issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, and then something happens, and it all gets turned back around, and these same-sex couples are wondering if their marriage license even holds any water, if it's legitimate. What do you see down the future? Well, again, with the U.S. Supreme Court denying to hear the case out of Utah, I think it makes it a little bit more unlikely that the, the court would then come back and grant a stay. Um, halting marriages in Idaho 
putting in all sort of influx whether these marriages are actually valid. Mm -hmm. It's more likely that even if they take a case, there may not be a stay. Ryan Fisher says he would like the governor to just say, I'm not going to issue, I'm not going to allow the issuance of any more same-sex marriage licenses, period. Upholding the Constitution and, of Idaho. But defying the Ninth Circuit. Is that a possibility? And what would be the repercussions? Well, I think it's, it's not a, a good possibility. And it's probably something the state of Idaho would want to avoid. Uh, that is sort of defying the order from the Ninth Circuit, which is a federal court. Um, the issues that were decided in front of the Ninth Circuit were issues of federal constitutional law. And that's why they were in federal court. Hmm. And federal, the federal constitution trumps the state constitutions. Well, it'll be interesting to see because as the state says, it's not done necessarily. Not quite yet. Wait and see. <laughs> Shakira Sanders, we appreciate you coming back in. Thanks, we do. Stay Thanks. on our uh, fast forward ring <laughs> dial. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to speed dial. Thanks, Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Now the On Your Side forecast with Chief Meteorologist Scott Dorval. Well, it's that time of year, mid-October. The leaves are falling. With the wind today, we had a lot of leaves falling. I want to show you a picture from Cap and Albertson Park sent in by Terry Brown. Great shot here. The colored leaves over the top of the... Uh uh, the little stream there around one of the little uh, the ponds in Catherine Albertson Park. Beautiful picture there. Great colors, orange and yellows and reds. Lots of colors out there right now and more to come over the next couple of weeks in the valley. Great shot there. You can send your photos into iContribute at KIVITV.com. Let's see if we can get a huge gallery of all of the fall colors around the state and around the northwest if you can. High temperature today only 61 degrees. Yesterday it was 80. Today 61. 5 degrees below average. Low this morning was down to 49. It'll be colder tomorrow morning. Only a trace of precipitation fell in that rain shower that pushed on through. 40 in Stanley was the best they could do with rain and snow showers in the mountains. 60s in the valley. That cool moist flow is now turning into a cool drier flow. That's why we're going to dry out with a chance of some frost coming up tomorrow and then partly cloudy. Only 64 tomorrow. So still another cool day coming up. But there are changes for the weekend ahead. I almost got blown off my bike today in the foothills. <laughs> oh, you were there when the front came yeah, through. Yeah, the front came were through. Were you not listening to his forecast yesterday? Uh, <laughs> We're right here every night. I just figured, <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, go Try for it, it anyway. right? Throw caution to the, <laughs> to the wind. wind. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Well, the Broadway Bridge near Boise State is well used by cars and pedestrians, but now there are plans to close the bridge for almost a year, and that leaves a lot of questions for commuters, but also for sports fans who use it to make their trek to Albertson Stadium. Fox 9's Lauren Johnson is live in studio tonight with the information. Lauren? It's true, prepare for closure, but we do have some advance notice. Construction on Broadway Bridge is scheduled to begin December of 2015. And by construction, it means a complete replacement of the bridge. During tonight's public online meeting, ITD said that replacing the almost 60-year-old Broadway Bridge will take almost a year, scheduled to be completed in November of 2016. You can see just how busy this bridge is. It's used by vehicles, but also pedestrians who are walking to the stadium and the green belt. Closure of the old bridge is a concern to many and alternate routes will be in place. The planned route will be Beacon through Park Center to Front Street. And for the sports fans, <laughs> ITD is planning their construction around the football season, beginning just after the last football game of 2015 and hoping to finish up before the first football game of 2016. And that new bridge, it will be six lanes, three in each direction with 10 foot wide sidewalks, bike lanes and piers or tiered lookouts to stop and enjoy the river. There are there are also plans for the green belt under the bridge, open views of the river, and a raised pathway to prevent flooding. In studio, Lauren Johnson, Fox 9 on your side. The Nampa School District is finally back in the black. Nampa School administrators say they have eliminated almost $6 million in deficit. The financial problems all began more than two years ago when the district discovered overspending and miscounting of millions of dollars. The district now plans to put half a million dollars into its rainy day fund and then use the rest of its $1.7 million on substitute teachers, upgrading computer labs, and student transportation. You're going to hear just how the district got out of the debt coming up in minutes in tonight's Making the Grade interview. Fox 9 on your side has much more news in our second half hour. The season for frights is nearly here. And the man who played Michael Myers in the Halloween horror film joins us live in studio for an interview.
Also, we dig into the voting records of two women who want to run Idaho's schools. That's next in this week's Making the Raid. Roland Ferris, Michelle Edmonds, Chief Meteorologist Scott Dorval, Sports with Paul Gerke. This is Fox 9 on your side at 9. Well, you can certainly bet on this. Education is a hot topic in the upcoming Idaho state elections. And with less than three weeks before voters go to the polls, we're digging into the candidates' voting records. With Idaho Education News reporter Kevin Richard and this week's Making the Grade. Kevin's back. Who knew, Kevin, that making the grade could be so exciting during this political <laughs> season? We've got a lot to talk about We here. do, in just a few minutes. First, before we go into politics and education, let's start with some good news for the Nampa School District. What happened last night? Well, last night they got their audit report, and the good news, uh, which has been a long time coming for them, they're in the black. They're in the black by about $1.7 million. And this was a district that not too long ago we were writing about a $5.3 million shortfall. We are talking about school closures furloughs, teacher positions being left dark. So this is a, a big turnaround for Nampa and uh, a, a chance now for the district to maybe kind of recalibrate and focus on academics as opposed to uh, just trying to balance the books. So a lot of people would ask, how'd they do it? I mean, that's, that's a pretty good changeover. Well, there were some tough cuts along the way and we saw it last year, 14 furlough days. That's a big chunk of the calendar. But those days have all been restored back into the calendar this year. So it's obviously it's been a difficult process and you can't forget three uh, supplemental levies approved by the voters. That certainly helped uh, help balance the books. When we had a chance to sit down and talk with the brand new superintendent over in Nampa, he was really thankful to the community for supporting those levies. Are they giving him any credit on pat on the back for this turnaround? Well, now I think the focus will be on, on him. Now you've kind of got a district that's back on its feet financially. It's a chance for him as a new superintendent to uh, maybe leave his mark on the district academically because now the focus can be more on, on academics as, as we talked as about with be. him back in, in, in July when he first took the job. And as he wants it to be too. Mm -hmm. Okay, turning to politics and education, yes. we're down to the wire a couple weeks before the election here. New polls coming out, the race for state superintendent, pretty close. Three races are really close within the margin of error, according to the survey, the superintendent's race, the governor's race, and a lot of the surveys to date on the governor's race showed uh, Butch Otter with a fairly large lead. That's within the margin of error. So is the secretary of state's race. So if you believe that poll that came out on Tuesday, you got three races that are very much in play. A lot of things may still break for the Republicans just because of the way the electorate kind of comes around to Republicans in Idaho. Uh, historically, but the races right now look like they're fairly close. And the fundraising, which I wrote about last week, uh, in the governor's race, in the secretary of state's race, and in the superintendent's race, Democrats have raised more money than the Republicans. Now, some of that is uh, A.J. Belukov putting a lot of money, uh, his own money, personal into the race. money. Holly Woodings loaning uh, a good deal of money to her campaign for secretary of state. But if you believe the money aspect of the race and the polling, these are going to be competitive races, perhaps, in the final three weeks. So on that note, Idaho Education News did a little digging into the state superintendent race and specifically into the voting records of the two candidates. What did you find out? Well, what Clark Corbin, our reporter, found on this is uh, Sherry Ibarra, who moved to Mountain Home in 1996, has never voted in a November election, general election in Mountain Home in all of that time. Never? Never. Now, back in April, we wrote about how Ibarra did not vote in 2012, the year that the propositions one, two, and three were on the ballot. Well, we went back and looked further because Jana Jones, uh, her Democratic opponent, has been saying, hey, she's never voted in a general election. So we wanted to look into it and find out if Jones was telling the truth. Telling the truth. And it turns out Ibarra has never voted in a general election. So she has missed, by our count, at least 15 elections. And what about for Jones? Uh, her voting record's been pretty consistent. She's uh, voted in every election, according to Bonneville County. Uh, she hasn't missed one. All right, there's a lot going on, and <laughs> this was just three a weeks snapshot. Away. Exactly, less than three weeks away. And Kevin's going to be a part of our election coverage. If you want much more education news, politics of education, and there we are interviewing the superintendent of the Nampa schools, just go to IdahoEdNews.org. Kevin, thanks for being here, for making the grade. Thank you.
Coming up later on Fox 9 on your side, the president cancels a fundraising trip to deal with the growing threat from Ebola. And Scott's over in the Weather Center gathering the up-to-the-minute weather information. He'll be back with his complete On Your Side forecast. Now the On Your Side forecast with Chief Meteorologist Scott Dorval. Well, early this afternoon, I spent the time with Barbara Morgan STEM Academy. These are the second graders here. We were talking about weather and they were studying the science of weather. They've already done many weather experiments and been studying how the weather works. And today we talked about how we measure the weather, how we can get good measurements to help me forecast what's going to happen with the weather coming up. And they had some amazing questions and I want to thank them all for what a great time we had today. And a big hello to all of the second graders at Barbara Morgan STEM Academy. Many of those questions are going to be asked right here at Fox 9 News at 9 in my special weather segment starting tonight. I've got a couple great questions from the kids and there'll be more coming up. So again, a big hello to everybody there today and a great time talking weather. And uh, just after I got there, just before I got there, Roland was on his bike running through a cold front and you're <laughs> going to see it right in here. Not Roland. Roland's up here somewhere. There's the wind whipping on by with that big old dust cloud coming in. That was a cold front coming through, but we had a lot of blue skies after that and the wind did settle down fairly quickly, which is certainly uh, good news for folks who didn't want all that wind. A nice sunset coming out out there tonight as well looking towards the west here a wide view shows a beautiful view of those high thin cirrus clouds some cumulus clouds there as well a tighter view shows again just a great looking shot there the dry weather is winning out but the high clouds they're streaming in those are going to win out overnight and if they thicken enough that can help act as a blanket and then keep the temperature up just a little bit and that might not give us some frost tomorrow morning but there's a chance for that uh, live view from the village at meridian a beautiful evening if you don't mind the cool temperatures temperatures really dropping 49 degrees, but the wind is gone. So again, the humidity is up a little bit as that dry air has been moving in. There's that chance for getting some frost tomorrow morning if we can keep the skies mostly clear. But call today, chilly indeed, only 57 for the high, 40 this morning's low, and did have six hundredths of an inch of some rain falling. But up on top of Brundage Mountain, we had snow coating the mountain today. And this shot of Stanley actually shows that. Stanley, the ranger station, sits about 6,400 feet. This is about 6,300 feet here in Stanley, and the snow line is right here along the sawtooth. This is the dusting right here with some little heavier snows up to the uh, the uh, tops of the sawtooth there. 13 hundredths of an inch measured. Much of the day it was only in the 30s. It hit 57 for a high, but that was briefly. Then the cool air came in. Now, cool air will continue to move in from the north and west. It's 34 in Stanley right now, near 49 to 50 in the Treasure Valley. The rain showers have added just a little ground clutter around the radar. That's really about it. Before we look at the high pressure, I want to show you what's happening right now. Dry air moving in, clouds of rain and snow to the northeast, but this is what I've been watching. These high clouds here are drifting in now. They may break up tonight and high clouds don't really keep the heat into the uh, lower atmosphere as much as low clouds do, but still they can have that effect. So we may not get a widespread frost in the Treasure Valley, but I think your garden may finally be hit by some frost. It's this cloud cover here that I think will give us a very murky, cloudy midday tomorrow. It's not going to be a mostly sunny day. There's going to be a lot of that cloud cover around. There'll also be some sunshine trying to mix in. That frontal system is gone and so the wind is gone as well, which is certainly good news. And this computer chart shows it right here. That's the cloud mass moving through. Now after two o'clock, we may start to break out a little more sunshine, but we certainly have some clouds coming right on in. So we take a look at that forecast chart and it shows over the weekend. We do have a warm up, some nice weather coming in, but boy, a little chilly start to the day tomorrow with a chance for frost, lows in the 30s, high temperatures in the mid 60s, a lot of cloud cover. Even right after you drop off the kids at school, it could become mostly cloudy, no precipitation, but we'll get sunshine mixed in from time to time. The West Central Mountains, I expect temperatures 55 to 60 degrees. Garden Valley around 63. My forecast for the Magic Valley in the low 60s, a chance for frost in the morning with that cloud sunshine mixture. A little bit more sunshine in the Magic Valley than in the Treasure Valley. But my underside forecast, the extended forecast now shows the temperatures warming. Remember, low 60s today, mid 60s tomorrow, a chilly day, but up to 72 Friday, then hovering near 70 to 72 on Saturday and Sunday. And I think we'll get a good deal of sunshine coming in. It does get cooler. Our next bet for rain isn't until next week, but a pretty good weekend showing up. In fact, Friday night starts the weekend with a big Bronco football game. The weather looks oh, yeah. pretty good, partly cloudy. So the leaves won't be swirling all over the place. That was like pretty they cool were. today. I tried to take <laughs> some video for you, actually. All I thought was all those leaves just left my yard <laughs> and, <laughs> and my tree else's and they're gone. Yard. <laughs> Sorry to Scott's neighbors. <laughs> yes, here's what's coming up next. Officials questioning domestic airline passengers after some potentially troubling Ebola news. I'm Alicia Acuna in Dallas. I'll have the latest coming up.
And do you need our help or have a story idea? Just email us through our website, IdahoOnYourSide.com. We'll check it out. You're watching Fox 9 On Your Side at 9. President Obama canceled a fundraising trip over Ebola. The president called top advisors together for a hastily arranged meeting late this afternoon. Fox's Alicia Acuna in Dallas again tonight, the epicenter of a rapidly growing fear over a horrific disease. She has the latest right now in America. With a second nurse now diagnosed with the Ebola virus, health authorities decontaminated her home and alerted neighbors with a recorded phone message. Please be advised that a health care worker who lives in your area has tested positive for Ebola. We're working to, to determine exactly where all she might have gone that could potentially need decontamination. But the concern stretches far beyond Texas. The victim, 26-year-old nurse Amber Vinson, had flown on a Frontier Airlines flight from Cleveland to Dallas on Monday. It was a breach in protocol according to the Centers for Disease Control. She should not have traveled on a commercial airline. The nurse had extensive contact with Thomas Eric Duncan, the first U.S. Ebola fatality who died last week. Nobody in contact with Duncan was to fly commercially, the CDC says. We will, from this moment forward, ensure that no other individual who is being monitored for exposure undergoes travel in any way other than controlled movement. The airline is contacting the other 132 passengers and Cleveland Hopkins International Airport is disinfecting certain areas. But authorities say the risk is low because the nurse wasn't showing symptoms during the flight other than a low-grade fever. Vincent is being moved to Emory University in Atlanta, one of four U.S. biocontainment units. We know that there are opportunities to do more and better and we're doing that. But the breakdown in communication is the latest concern in the U.S. handling of the virus. The country's largest nurses union alleges their members have not only lacked proper safety equipment, but have been left to train each other. They are, quote, one shift away from someone else getting sick, the union says. We're a hospital that may have done some things different with the benefit of what we know today. And while the hospital here works to contain a potential outbreak, the public is growing increasingly skeptical. In a new Fox News poll, 42 percent of voters say they don't believe the country is ready to handle Ebola. In Dallas, Alicia Acuna, Fox News. An Oklahoma teenager charged with three counts of murder allegedly for killing his entire family. And get this, all to make himself the lone heir to the family's fortune. Police say 19-year-old Alan Ruby fatally shot his father, mother, and 17-year-old sister. The teen is the son, 50-year-old John Ruby, respected in the community and publisher of a rural newspaper, The Marlow Review. According to officers, the teen owed a loan shark and killed his family so he would inherit the family's wealth. His mother and father had recently advised him that as far as his finances go, they were not going to allow uh, a lot of money to come out uh, to him anymore. They were going to cut him off. Police say Ruby killed the family on Thursday and then took a lavish trip to Dallas for the weekend. The bodies were discovered Monday by the family's maid. Ruby faces three charges of first degree murder. Prosecutors are considering seeking the death penalty. A 10 year old boy brutally murders a 90 year old woman in northeastern Pennsylvania. The incident happened Saturday when the suspect allegedly became angry that the woman yelled at him. He reportedly held a cane against her throat and repeatedly punched her, killing her in the process. The 10 year old is now being charged as an adult with criminal homicide. Well, President Obama talked with European leaders in a video conference today as questions are being raised about the U.S.-led plans to defeat Islamic State militants. ISIS is gaining more ground in the Anbar province, and now Iraqi troops are starting to back down as concerns are growing that militants could actually take over Baghdad. All right. In northern Syria, the fiercest fighting is taking place in Kobani, and the situation is made worse since Turkey refuses to help protect that border city. From Washington, Fox's Peter Ducey has more right now in the world. As ISIS surges in Iraq and the town of Kobani on the Syrian border, President Obama is facing calls for the U.S. to expand its military operations before the extremists take control of even more territory. But the Obama administration insists the U.S.-led coalition's strategy is working. Our strategy in Iraq and Syria does require forces on the ground, but they must be local forces. And we will help them. We will support them. 
We will train them. The U.S. strategy for Iraq and Syria is being managed by General John Allen, who is serving as a special envoy. Allen just returned from Turkey, where he tried to push the government to get more involved in the fight against ISIS. He says there is still a lot of work to do in order to defeat militants in the region. We're only new into this uh, strategy. We're only new into the use of airstrikes. Fresh accusations that the government withheld knowledge about chemical weapons inside Iraq surfaced in a recent New York Times article. The Times is reporting that U.S. forces recently discovered 5,000 chemical warheads inside Iraq that were built by Saddam Hussein. The Pentagon today picked a name for its military effort against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Operation Inherent Resolve. The name was selected by U.S. Central Command officials. In Washington, Peter Ducey, Fox News. From vending machines to the cafeteria, school lunch is changing. I'm Leland Vittert in Washington with the economics behind it. And remember, for the latest news, you can always visit us online anytime. Search for Idaho on your side on Facebook and Twitter. Now, the Allergy Report, brought to you by Boise Valley Asthma and Allergy Clinic. Well, this is the last week we're doing the Allergy Report, so the sage has to go away at the end of this week. It just has to, since we're not going to talk about it after this week. It's still at 56 in the high category. It's hanging on, but the wind probably helped today. Uh, Roland, did you notice any sage while you were riding your bike in the dust storm? <laughs> yeah, it all went up my nose. <laughs> Along with all the dust. <laughs> That's exactly right. All right, thanks, Scott. Well, as been said, an army marches on its stomach, and any teacher will tell you a school does as well. And that's why the latest federal inclusion into what students eat has a lot of young people belly aching. Fox's Leland Vitter has the details in tonight's Fox Fitness. The lunch lady is now a health czar, as fruits and veggies mean pork for school districts. Under new federal rules championed by First Lady Michelle Obama, schools must now conform to strict guidelines on what they can and cannot serve in order to receive subsidies. Often, hard-boiled eggs don't make the cut. Too much sodium. And forget about traditional pizza. One school district in Maryland even got rid of their fryers to keep the money flowing. With the new regulations, it gives us the opportunity to encourage and have a child take a fruit or vegetable. And quite honestly, that's great because students should consume more fruits and vegetables. Kids are voting with their mouths. A new survey showed 83% of school districts reported increased food waste. And a growing number of districts say the rules aren't worth the cash. In Campbell County, Kentucky, Superintendent Gene Kircher gave up more than a quarter million dollars in federal money. We're watching kids after they go past the, you know, the cash register throw away what they were forced to take in the lunch line. In South Carolina, high schooler Madeline Taylor started an online petition asking for the district to bring back pizza and french fries. A lot of students can't afford to bring lunch boxes, which means, you know, they're not going to be eating the food because it's not good. It's not just lunch lines being regulated. Vending machines, once a source of revenue for schools, now have to have healthier options. And say goodbye to the traditional fundraising bake sale. Cookies and donuts are no more. In Washington, Leland Vittert, Fox News. You know we're going to have fun on Fox 9 with our weather whiz kids when Scott comes back and says, you will not believe the type of questions I was asked. <laughs> wow, kind of like the picture behind you. It's going to be spectacular, right? Very spectacular. You know, we've been doing this for a couple of years, so a couple of school seasons here, and I tell you what, I thought I was going to get a lot of repeats, and I really haven't had a lot today. Got all kinds of different ones. Here's a couple of those questions. Hi, my name is Addison Weevil, and I go to Bob and Morgan STEM Academy. And my question is, how can it feel cold outside if the sun is still shining on you? My name is Madeline Lawrence, and I go to Barbara Morgan STEM Academy. And my question is, does weather occur in outer space? Hmm, two great questions there, right? Well, let's first of all tackle that first question about if the sun is shining on you, how can it still feel cool? Well, the sun's energy doesn't really heat the air. The sun heats solid objects, and so the sun's energy heats the earth, and the earth warms the atmosphere from the bottom up. That's why it's warmer down near the ground and it's cooler aloft. And so when we get less energy from the sun, of course, the air starts to cool around the globe. But if we're in the sun, it can feel warm. But I think what she's talking about 
realize you're in the sun this time of year. It feels warm. You walk into the shade and now it feels cool because the air is cooling off. But when that sun shines on us directly, we're a solid object. We get warm directly from the sun. So that's what makes the difference there. Now we're talking about weather in outer space. Can that happen? Well, I looked and technically outer space starts at about uh, 62 miles up, about 100 kilometers up. This is the lower layer of the atmosphere. This is the tropopause, the troposphere that we live in. And this is where most of our general real weather is, where all the moisture is. Thunderstorms can sometimes pop up over that into the stratosphere. But really, this is where the layer of weather is. But there is something called space weather that occurs as well. So they call it space weather. But when you're talking about what we call practical weather, here's a thunderstorm. And this is the, the, the dividing line between the, uh, the troposphere and the stratosphere, the next layer. And this is where everything is a big inversion up here. So nothing goes past it unless you get a big gust of wind and it pushes the thunderstorm up into the next layer. That's as high as it gets. But you can call this space weather the energy coming in from the sun. It's not the weather that's going to give us rain, but we can get the northern lights from this. And we saw a little bout with this in the U.S. not too long ago. So it can be pretty impressive when that occurs. So guys, I guess yes, but not the weather that we think about. Yeah, no, but still, but still beautiful. Yes, yes. with those oh, northern gorgeous. lights. Those are good questions. I can't wait. We're going to have these kinds of questions Lots from of good ones. them all week. Yes. And Barbara next Morgan week. <laughs> kids. Smarties over yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Thanks, Scott. All right. He terrified a generation. Next on Fox 9 on your side, the man who played the killer in Halloween 5 joins <laughs> us live in studio. Welcome back, everyone. Don Shanks, who, uh, the actor who played Michael Myers in the horror film Halloween 5, is in Boise for our, the Idaho Horror Film Festival. Shanks also well known for playing Nakoma in the TV show Grizzly Adams, which I remember so well. And he joins us live in studio this evening along with Molly Deckert from the Horror Film Festival. Thanks for being here, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. This is fantastic. Don, let me talk to you first. What, you played an iconic character mm -hmm. for uh, a number of years. Uh, what was your favorite way to kill someone? Um, <laughs> the knife. The but knife's always a favorite way. But they came up with unique and innovative ways well, to do that. I came up with that. those. Did you really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, part five, it has kind of a farm theme. Yeah. Because I grew up on a farm. So the mowing side, the mm -hmm. porch, pitchfork, and all mm -hmm. that, you know. Mm -hmm. And they, we were using real weapons. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that becomes obviously very problematic to deal with that kind of stuff, isn't it? Well, I throw knives and tomahawks, and I <sighs> deal with live weapons all the time. Wow. I mean, as you travel around, and you're still working, obviously, but yes. um, are you surprised how, uh, how big of an attraction this has become? It wasn't until I did my first personal appearance and how, you know, they, people were just going crazy. It was like Star Trek. Right, fans. right, right. Yeah. Tell us about the mask here, because this well, was originally, originally, what was the model for the mask? Originally, the mask was, they went to the Five and Dime and got a William Shatner mask. <laughs> <laughs> they had Leonard Nimoy and uh -huh. William Shatner, and they decided on William Shatner, and they just took it, and they put white shoe polish on it. Yeah, Bill Shatner's a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's kind of plain looking. <laughs> but this one's made from uh, Greg Nicotero, who uh, is part of k &B special effects makeup. He's also one of the producers on Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. But it's his face and my face kind of combined. Wow, and one of the masks is in the Smithsonian. Yes, mm -hmm. and That's I have another one. That's there were only three. Pretty fantastic. Now, you're in Idaho, of course, because we've got the Horror Film Festival first year, Molly. Yes. Tell us, uh, I mean, how did this come about? We started planning this back in January, so it's been crazy momentum mm -hmm. up until now. And Don was gracious enough to come and be part. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the 25th anniversary of this film. And mm -hmm. Don will be there. We're screening it on Saturday at 7.30 at the Egyptian. And the whole festival is a way to really give Idaho filmmakers a platform. And mm -hmm. so if you are an Idaho filmmaker, past or present, or you've crewed uh, your film from people in Idaho, it is a free submission. So very cool. Should be fun. Very cool. And yeah. you can get scared while you're at it. Yeah. Um, I, how do you audition for a role like this? Because you don't talk much. Well, what it, it's <laughs> considered a stunt part. Is so, it really? Yeah. So the stunt coordinator called me and asked if I was available for work. And I go, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he, and I didn't know it was for Michael Myers. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I was you know, going to be doing stunt work. And he goes, well, you got to come and talk to the director. And I'm going, okay. So I go in, and he goes, okay. He was French and uh, Swiss. He goes, I want you to walk like wood through water. So I got up and walked, and he goes, okay. 
That was it? That was it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. What a great role to have, huh? Oh, yeah. Just chill. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, let's put up the information for the Horror Film Festival, the Idaho Horror Film Festival. Thursday through Saturday, there's the information right there. And, of course, the Egyptian Theater, a great place to be. Thank you both for being here tonight. Well, thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you Happy so much. Happy Halloween in advance. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Here's I'll a live... go and kill somebody for you. <laughs> <laughs> in the films. Here's a live look at Boise from the Fort Dealers Tower Cam. It's got to be back with the final look at your weather coming up.